So what we're going to do is look at what's called the VCM game, Voluntary Contributions Mechanism game, uh, which basically has to do with um, looking at people's willingness to help out other people when it's a little bit costly to themselves. Now, on Friday, last Friday, uh, Ted Bergstrom, who's a visiting uh, prof from UC Santa Barbara, uh, we have the Erskine Fellowship Program and get these uh, distinguished speakers in, uh, gave us a talk on the problem of voluntary donations to uh, bone marrow uh, transplants. Okay. And a, a fascinating talk. I'm, my guess is, uh, even if you haven't had any economics, you will understand 90% of the, of the talk and find it very, very interesting and informative. Uh, there are people who um, have leukemia. They, uh, they need bone marrow transplants. They try and get it from a sibling if they can, but that's not always, if there's a match, that's not always possible. Uh, so they have this donor registry where people can volunteer to put their, uh, have their DNA tested and then register to, in case there's uh, someone who needs a, a, a bone marrow transplant, uh, to match their DNA along a little, a little strip. Um, unfortunately, uh, extracting um, bone marrow is painful. Okay? And um, I, had a, uh, I had a bone biopsy for a condition I had, and they take a drill that's as big as your finger, and it goes right into your hip. Okay? And it took me about it was, I mean, they put you under anesthetic, all kinds of stuff happened to me while I was under anesthetic. The recovery was really bad. It's like there's a, there's a cost to helping out other people when you, when you do these uh, kinds of things. And yet there are many people that actually do contribute to that. And one of the questions Ted asked is what motivates people to do that? And the other is should the registry be larger or smaller? Like, uh, and it does a little cost-benefit analysis of that. So if you're interested in, in applying economic ideas and strategic ideas like this, this um, idea of of uh, what we're going to see is free riding or prisoner's dilemma type problems to real world situations. And uh, go and have a listen to Ted's seminar. It's up on the on the um, UCTV website. Very good. So anyhow, what we're going to do is is we're going to uh, play a little voluntary contributions game, and then uh, we're going to we're going to analyze the game. And this is a different kind of strategic situation. The first uh, three, well. First couple lectures, we played a stop-go game, talked about it a bit, did a bit of analysis, the game tree, got you into this thinking of this, these sequential games. And we, then we had some stylized sequential games. And the key feature about the sequential game was the ability to, to observe what other people are going to do and react to it. And other players can anticipate that other people will see what you're doing and that you're going to be reacting to that and thinking about that. And then we had this whole convoluted way of thinking, but we thought, oh, backward induction helps us work through as long as you know what the game is. When you're not sure what the game is, it's a little more complicated exactly what you're going to do. But if everybody knows the payoffs in the game and they know who the players are and they know what they can do and they're intelligent, you're going to have time to work it out, lots of ifs, okay, uh, um, then you, could, you can come up with a prediction for what you think will happen uh, in the game. And again, it makes sense in light of those big assumptions, but not so much if people are inexperienced, they don't have time, they can't figure it out, they're confused. Okay? But that was sequential games. And the idea of the, the sequence wasn't just time, but it was this idea of observing and commitment. Okay? When you observe somebody do something, then they've done it. They can't change it. They're committed to it. Okay? And uh, now we're going to look at a different kind of game, which is... Uh, strategic interaction where you can't see what other players are going to do. Now, this, this sort of happens all the time. I had a really recent experience of it is that um, I used to do a lot of small boat sailing when I was a, uh, a teenager and in my early 20s. And, and then, you know, you get working, you have family and give it away. And then in the 80s, I started up again, but I ran into some health problems with the back. And then last year while I was on holiday, I was out on a little sailboat again. And I love this. So I thought I'd buy myself a little laser. A laser is uh, kind of a one-person boat. Um, you can get big sails, which is too much for me, or medium sails, which is not too bad. And they, I looked on Trade Me, okay? and they're kind of going from between, well, 100 bucks <laughs> uh, up to 10,000 bucks. Okay? And I'm thinking, uh, I, I don't really want to look at the 10,000 ones. I just haven't got enough money for that. And uh, I looked at the low end, like around 1,000, but the ones that were around 1,000 were just pretty, you just, even looking in the on uh, trade me, it looked pretty bad. But in the middle range, there about you know a couple of thousand. I thought it would be I could I could do that. You know, and I wanted a trolley. I wanted something 
but they're all 20 years old, which is a bit of a bummer. Uh, but some of them have been taken care of pretty good. And so I decided to bid on trading. I'd never done this before, you know. And in the first place, I'm really reluctant to spend two or 3000 bucks, and I haven't actually seen the things. And these are all in the North Island, these things. But uh, there, was, uh, there was one for sale, and I was actually overseas when I entered this bidding process. And uh, my partner here was doing the, the, the bidding for me, kind of. And uh, it's kind of interesting, you see, because you have to come up with a number, you know. And there's a reserve price, which was like 1800 bucks, something like that. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, what should I bid? Okay. You know, I'd, I'd like to get it for 1800 but I've been watching some other auctions, and I thought, you know, it's hard to tell what these things are going to go for. So the first thing I did is I figured, when am I going to get out? <laughs> you know, like if the bidding goes up, and when, when am I actually going to get out? And I figured, well, okay, once it hits 3000 I don't want to pay three, more than 3000 for something that's 20 years old. If I'm going to do that, then I might jump up a notch and go for the 10-year-old guys, which are about five or six, or maybe even new one, which is eight or nine. I've got to take out loans to do that, but I, you know, I, I could manage the, the lower one. So I, I put an upper limit for myself, which I told my partner which he didn't do. <laughs> uh, however, um, what we had to do was come up with a bid. Now, th the kind of thing is you're trying to figure out what are other people going to bid. I can't see what they're going to bid. Now, it turns out on Trade Me, you actually can. I mean, like my partner Lynn had done a lot of this sort of Trade Me sort of stuff, and she said, everybody bids at the last minute. You know, they just wait. They just sort of sit there and kind of wait till the closing time, and then, wham, all these bids come on. And they also have a little, little thing where you can have an automatic increase which means you can actually see the, the history of, of, of bids. So that's kind of like a sequential game, because right? you can observe what other people have done and then respond to it. And you gotta, but in the last minute, you know, as it gets squeezed down there, and actually what happened is our internet connection went down. You know, uh, the bidding went up to about 3,300, and I told her, I said, cut off at 3,000, but she thought, oh, you know, I'll just I'll keep doing it. So she went up to, to about 32, and I think it eventually it sold for 34, something like that. But, that kind of game, if you, if you didn't have that automatic bid increment, you couldn't see the history, you would have to put in a bid without knowing what other people are going to do. Okay? Now, there are other types of auctions we call sealed bid auctions, where you're putting in a bid for, a, for something, and it's got to write it on a piece of paper, an envelope, it goes in to a pile, and there'll be some rules about who gets the item. Okay? Uh, sometimes it's the person with the highest bid. Um, uh, will, and then usually the person will get with the highest bid will get the item, but what they pay isn't, almost, isn't always what they bid. There's a thing called a second price auction where uh, what you do is you pay the second highest price. Like you, the, the, the highest bid wins, but you don't pay what you bid, but you only pay the second highest price. Now, there's a notorious case in Dunedin. I think the government was auctioning off radio spectrum uh, f frequencies, you know, licenses to run your, your TV stations or your cell phone towers or things like that. And, and I mean, telecoms in there, they were bidding and there was somebody else, some other student that was bidding and those were the only two people in the market and the student bid $1 and telecom bid $100,000. So telecom won, but they only paid a dollar. And so the, uh, it's like, whoa, you know, the people who designed that auction were sort of thinking, what do we do here? We didn't, you know, we didn't extract much revenue. But it was a sealed bid kind of auction, you know, anybody could have bid. Um, and, um, uh, but the strategy is that you can't really figure out, I mean, you can't see what the other person's going to do in a sealed bid option, auction. So you've got to think about it, okay? And this is, it's a different kind of reasoning that, that uh, applies in simultaneous games. Um, okay, another, like another simple uh, simultaneous game that I face every day is I live in Governors Bay, and I come over the hill. Now, it's, it's a beautiful place to live over there. It's actually only nine minutes over the hill, as long as the traffic's not too bad. But you hit the bottom of, of Cashmere Road and Dyer's Pass, there's an intersection. You do that from about uh, 10 to 8 till 8.30, and you will sit there for at least five minutes trying to get across that T-intersection. There's cars, because everybody's going up the hill to bring their kids. There's a, there's a bunch of people who want to get off of the motorway, so they're coming along Cashmere Road. There's people coming the other way, going out to, to Ralston or the, to the south. And you're just, you're just sitting there. You, there's no brakes in the traffic, no lights. It's a real pain in the butt, okay? And, but I have to make up my mind when to leave. At the same time, other people are making up their minds when to leave, and we all, none of us know, you know, I mean, by experience, I've kind of learned now that, okay, if I get there before quarter to eight, we'll get across the intersection okay, otherwise, it, it, you know, just a pain in the butt. Well, that's another kind of strategic interaction situation where you're making choices, 
other people are making choices. You can't see their choices. They can't see your choices. But each of you are thinking about what the other person's doing, uh, and you, you know, that there's a strategic interaction situation where you can't observe, but you can think. Now, what we're going to do is run to a, a, a kind of a stylized example of what's called um, giving to a public good. Now, I, I want to stop for a second and think about what a public good is. Um, a public good has two characteristics, and they sort of hang on the answer to two questions. Uh, and this can be kind of an abstract, abstract definition, and we'll give you an example. The first question is, with a public good, is it easy to exclude people from using that good? Okay, So that's an excludability question. And the second thing is the thing about how many people can use this without imposing too many extra costs? Okay, so uh, let's take an example. Take Hagley Park. Okay, so you think of Hagley Park, and in its current sort of configuration, there's some nice paths through it. There's trees. There's a golf course. There's you know there's ducks. There's some parking, you know, and there's a botanic garden. There's a lot of nice features in in Hagley Park. Okay, and somebody has to pay for all of those features. Uh, it's a, it is publicly provided, but we're we're stepping back from the, you know how how do you actually pay for this and, and get this thing uh, this thing going? We're just saying here's the park. It's got some nice characteristics. Okay, you could think of changing those. You know, you could add some more grass. You could put in some more trees. You could uh, put in another lake. You could improve the botanic gardens. Um, all kinds of things that you could change in the park. It costs to change those things. Okay, and uh, one of the things about looking at uh, improving the park is I think, you know, do I want to contribute to the improvements of the park? Yeah, well, I like improvements of the park, you know. I don't know how much I'm willing to pay because I don't use Hagley Park very much, but I, you know, I kind of like it. Um, it might be 10 bucks a year to contribute to it. But I'm thinking of my contribution in light of my personal benefit from the park. If I contribute 10 bucks, and or something, and it helps improve the park. It's it's true. I get the benefit of the improvement, but so does anybody else who uses it. Okay, and that's what we mean, kind of, by this idea of, uh, well, it, it, of non-rivalry in use. Is that yes, it costs extra to improve things or to to build a public good, but other people can benefit from that with, at no extra cost, really, at all. Okay. And so that's really the rivalry question. Now, you could say, well, we could exclude people from the park and you know, charge them entrance fees or something like that or one for their use. And yeah, you, you can exclude in a park, but it's also it'd be pretty costly to actually do it effectively. Okay? I mean, I don't know. Um, there, there's lots of different entrance points to, to – you'd have to put a fence around it. You know, it'd be like Disneyland, the theme park. If you wanted to make it a theme park, it, it's possible to exclude and to charge people. Okay? But those are the two questions. It's like, um, can you exclude – and if, is it easy or not? And if, it, uh, if the answer is yes, that's part way to a public good. Uh, no. uh, it, if, I think I put this down on the handout wrong, actually. The, there's two questions I want to ask. Can you exclude people? And if the answer is yes, uh, then that's not really a public good. It's leaning towards what we call a private good. And the other thing is, is it rivalrous? That is, if one person uses it, can you extend its use to other people without incurring some other costs? Now, those costs might be, uh, you know, arranging for other people to use it. Uh, they might be uh, that other people's use of it interferes with yours. Like, you know, if I go jogging through Hagley Park, you know, on a Sunday morning or Saturday morning, I'm doing, I'm enjoying it. But if there's 10,000 other joggers there, it's kind of frustrating. Why am I here? You know, and, uh, I, there's, there's sort of a congestion cost. It doesn't have to be a, a direct cost. But you take something like a, a banana, you think, well, if I have this banana and I can eat it and consume it, then I've excluded you guys automatically in my use of it, right? And for you to consume my banana, uh, basically, for you to, we have to create another banana for you because I've, once I've used it, I've used it all up, okay? So it's very rivalrous. So if it's very rivalrous and it's easy to exclude, that's a private good or a pure private good. If it's not rivalrous and it's not easy to exclude, then we call that a public good. Okay? And the key thing about these public goods is they might not get provided. 
Okay? Because I'm sitting there, I'm looking at my, public, uh, my contributions to it, and I think, well, I'm willing for something to happen as long as I get some benefit out of it. Uh, like another classic example, uh, uh, sorry, let me just say it again. But I might not contribute at all or only contribute a little bit because I'm only looking at my benefit. I'm, I don't actually calculate all the benefits to all these other people. Okay, another example that's often used is, uh, for public good is things like street lighting. You know, we, we walk around uh, at, at night and we have all these street lights and, you know, it's, it's hard to exclude people from using the street lights, right? Whoops. Let's put this back up. It's hard to um, exclude people from using the street lights. Uh, and if you use the street lights, you know, it doesn't take anything away from my use of the street lights. It's non-rivalrous. So it's like a pure public good. But who builds the street lights? Okay. And what I think is in Governor's Bay, there aren't a lot of street lights. It's quite dark over there. And so I put up a little security light outside my garage, but it does nothing for the roadway. Anybody who's trying to visit my place and look at the address in the night is almost going to have a flashlight or bright car lights to, to shine because there isn't a lot of street lighting out there. Okay. Now, I'm willing to pay the 100 bucks or so to get the security light near my garage, but it would cost me probably twice that much to extend it down to the driveway and it's not worth it for me because every time I come in the driveway I got my lights I know where the place is I don't need that light in the street but all the other people who might be trying to find me at night or other properties they could really benefit but it doesn't happen okay they, they're not willing to pay the hundred bucks I'm not willing to pay the hundred bucks and yet we probably all get more than hundred bucks benefit out of it if we actually did it okay so that's the idea of of a, of a public good and we want to see Will people make contributions to a public good? So here's, I designed a little game. It's called the um, uh, Voluntary Contributions Mechanism Game. And as usual, we're going to start a game with um, uh, the PDIP idea. Who are the players? What can they do? What's their information? And what are their payoffs? Okay. So if you have a look at this, um, we've got two players. And again, we're going to be left-hand side people and right-hand side people. And I have some uh, uh, mini chocolate bars and coins, which uh, we're going to have to get rid of because I've got to replenish them for the next round of stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a few people on this side, and I'm going to give them four chocolate bars. You're looking hungry. Four chocolate bars? Okay. And I might try coins somewhere over here. Anybody look poor in this direction over here? You're looking very poor. There's four coins, okay? So you got, what's that, 80 cents? Four 20s, okay? Sorry, going to bypass you, Chris. You guys, some people got to sit near the aisles here, okay? Here you go. Take four coins. And... You guys want some chocolate bars? Four chocolate bars, okay. Okay, now the idea here is that um, you have an endowment. Uh, there are players on this side and there are players on that side. And let's, I mean, let's again, let's treat this as sort of anonymous. You've never met these people before in your life. And um, what you can do, you have to make a decision. Okay, I have given you the coins and the chocolate bars, okay? So they're yours. I'm not going to take them back. You got that idea? And they're, they're your endowment. You can do one of two things. You can keep your endowment for yourself, or you can give it back to me. Okay. And if you give it back to me, then I will basically double, well, no, I'll take 50% of what comes in, and I will distribute it back equally to you. Okay, so it's like, if you give me your private goods, the stuff that you have right in front of you now, um, I'm going to match that. I'm, I'm not the whole thing, but 50% worth, and then I'll redistribute it back to you equally. Okay? So that's, that's, the, that's the general idea of the game. Now let's try and uh, get a handle on this, this, um, this payoff idea. What I call the group account is... You're sitting there, you've got your, your private goods. You can make an investment. Think of it as an investment, okay? 
If the investment comes back to me, I'm going to do something with it. I'm just going to reach it in my bag here, and I'll increase it by 50%. That's the idea. Okay? And then, but, but that investment comes back to both of you, okay? and you share it equally. The key thing about it is you share it equally whether or not you contribute. Okay? So you're not getting, like it's not an investment, you know, you put in four, and, and because you put in four, you get back six. It's like if you put in four, so what was your name? Jeremy. Okay, if Jeremy puts in his, his four coins, and so what was your name? Joe. If Joe puts in his four chonka bars, okay, they, they are, I'm going to turn around and increase the group total, and I'll have four from Joe, and four, or four coins from Jeremy. I've got four. I'm going to make it up to six, but I'm going to take that six, and I'm going to give three back to Joe or three back to Jeremy. I'm going to split it between the other players because this is the group account. This is the, this is the, the thing that's good for both of you, okay? and you're going to share it equally. This is the park, if you like, the public good. Okay? So uh, at the same time, the other guys are sitting over there. They can decide to give four. So um, what was your name? Pardon? Alice. Alice, you got chocolate bars or money? Okay, money. Okay, so Alice has money and Jeremy has money. If Alice gives four and Jeremy gives four, that's eight in total, right? Okay. Like I said, you know, yesterday we were counting to ten. Today we're going to count a little bit easier, but we can all do it in our fingers. You might have to take your shoes off in the exam in order to use your toes if it's a little tough. We'll try and keep those nice calculations easy. But So Jeremy gives four, Alice gives four, I've got eight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to increase that by... 50%, so that's another 4. That makes 12. And then I'll redistribute it back to you guys, 6 each, if you both gave 4. If, if Jeremy gives nothing and Alice gives nothing, then I don't have anything, you know, 0 times 50 is 0, so there's nothing in the group account. If Jeremy gives 4, but Alice keeps her 4, then I'm going to take Jeremy's 4, turn it up in the group account, comes up to 6, 3 goes back to Jeremy, Three goes to Alice. Of course, Alice has already got her four, so she has seven. Okay, you got the idea. That's the that's the nature of the of the of the of the payoffs. It's like um, you can make a contribution to the group account. The group account will grow, or you can keep your own, uh, and and you will share equal in that, or you can keep your own private endowment and not give any at all. Okay, and you guys okay there with the chocolate bars? Have you got that sort of logic or not? You can choose which one of you is going to answer. <laughs> okay, so what's your name? Hmm? Poe? Poe? How, do you, how do you spell that? P E A I. P E A I L Peel. Okay. I can't pronounce it as well as I should. Peel. Has four chocolate bars. Okay. Unless you guys have eaten them already, eh? No, they're friends, okay? So if you if you you've got four chocolate bars, which you can keep, all right? You can give them to your friends, you can do whatever you like with them. If um Joe was to put four chocolate bars into the group account, you would, that group account would go from four to six, and you would split it equal with Joe. He would get back three, you would get three. Okay? And if you put your chocolate bars in, and Joe doesn't put his chocolate bars in, then you still get back, you put in your four, it goes up to six, you get back three, he gets three, he has a total of seven, you get three. Okay? And if you both put your chocolate bars in, four and four, that's eight, grows up to 12, split that equally, six each. Okay? Good idea. Okay. So th this is the this is the nature of the simultaneous choice is that you're thinking, okay, I've got to do something, and we're going to frame that. You can either frame it as keeping it or giving stuff. Okay. And I want you to think about the rest of you as well. I want you to think of three questions. The first question is, what are you going to do? Okay. This is a a game of strategic interaction. Uh, you've got to make a choice, and I mean, the people who aren't playing the game, try and think for yourself, what would you do in this circumstance? Okay? Are you going to keep the four chocolate bars, or are you going to give them to the group account? Now, 
uh, in the other games, you, we could see that we had this problem of what are your payoffs. Try and think of it, think of it through as like you're interested in your own chocolate bars. Okay? Just try and think of it through like that. You're interested in your own chocolate bars. Um, then, as you're thinking about what you're going to do, I want you to think about what the other player is going to do. Okay, so if these are the red players over here and those are the blue players over there, the, the red, you know, we, oh, you, you want to think, well, okay, I'm going to do something, but at the same time, I'm going to think about what the other guy is going to do. Now, the reason that we're going to do that is we want to ask a question for yourself is, okay, given what I think the other guy is going to do, am I doing kind of a good thing for myself? Okay. But then there's a third question. What do you think the other player will think that you're going to do? Okay, so we're sitting over here. Joe is sitting here. He's going to decide what he's going to do. Uh, or let's take Jeremy. And Jeremy's going to uh, decide what he's going to do. I've asked him to think about what Alice is going to do. Okay? And at the same time, I want you to go deeper. I don't want really you think what Alice is going to do, but I want you to think about what will Alice think that you're going to do. Okay? And of course, you keep on going here because Alice could be, uh, Jeremy could be thinking about what Alice is going to do, thinking about what Alice is, is going to be thinking about what he's going to do, could be thinking about what Alice is going to be thinking about what he's thinking about what she's thinking he's going to do. You know, just keep looping around like that. And that's, I mean, you, you know, it gets a little puzzling. That's what the Sicilian and the Princess Bride was so confusing about. It's like, ah, you know, too complicated to keep track of. Um, okay. So what I'd like you to do is the people I've given the stuff to uh, um, trying to answer those few questions. And those of you who don't have coins or chocolate bars, think about it for yourself. If you had, I mean, I'm, the reason I gave them this stuff is I didn't want them to walk out of here and, and have to pay anything, okay? And so you sort of think, well, if I had an endowment of four chocolate bars or four coins, what would I do? What do I think the other player is going to do? What do I think the other player is going to think that I'm going to do? So, Joe, have you put that through your processor on your computer and, and figured out what you're going to do yet? So, um, okay, now don't, I, I want you to whisper it to your neighbor, okay? There, just, okay. Yeah, and that's just verification purposes, so he can't change his mind, okay? Pearl, have you figured out what you're going to do? Okay, and so you can verify what she's going to do? Have you told him? Okay. Okay, so Joe, what are you going to do? Pardon? You're going to put them all in? What were you guys going to do? You were going to put them all in. Okay. Well, so each of the players decided to put them all in. So that would mean that that would be 8 in if I took them back and I multiplied them out. That would be a total of 12, and you'd get two more. And Joe would get two more, okay? Now, Alice, what did you do with your money? You're going to keep it? Jeremy, what about you? You're going to put it all in. Well, sadly, Jeremy, uh, when you put, <laughs> you put your money all in, you get, um, it go, the three comes into the group account, oh, sorry, four, gets multiplied to six, you get half back, okay? That's the return on investment, but Alice gets another three as well. So I shall give her another three and collect 10 cents off you, or kick one of the coins off you later, okay? Okay, so Alice, what, what were you thinking? Like, I mean, just, can you talk to me about what your reasoning process was? Um, well, if I put nothing in, put four in, I'd get seven. See, if I put four in, you put nothing in, then you'd get seven. If we both put four in, we'd get six. So if I get just kept it, then I'd get four. Okay, so what Alice did, Alice went through, a, if I did this, if I did that, and he did this sort of thing. Okay, Jeremy, can you think what you were doing? Yes. Okay, so Jeremy's saying, 
Jeremy's logic is, if I was looking at the game from a self-interested standpoint, then uh, it probably reads in the same way that Alice was here. You could either get four or seven, uh, right? If she puts in, if if she puts in none, you keep your four. If she puts in her four, you get back seven. It's like it seems like a pretty good thing to do, right? Um, and we're going to call that a dominant strategy in a second. Okay? The idea is that you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. So you think about what the other person is going to do. And you think, well, if they do this, I should keep my endowment. If they do that, I should keep my endowment. So like, it doesn't matter what they do. It looks sensible for me to keep my endowment. That's a dominant strategy. Okay? But the other side of it was a little puzzle. It's like, if you look at it another way, um, we could both come up with six. This is not quite as big as seven. But I might not get seven. Matter of fact, you probably wouldn't expect seven uh, if both of you played your dominant strategies. Okay? So um, Jeremy was also thinking, well, I could also look at it from the perspective of uh, trying to hope <laughs> that uh, there would be another we, – we, we could both get six, but you didn't both get six, did you? Okay. Now, the reason you didn't get both get six is that for, to get six, you would have to rely on Alice to um, – be contributing to the group account. And then you want to ask yourself, what would Alice be thinking? Okay? And Alice might be thinking, well, Jeremy's going to contribute to the group account. I could put in my money into the group account, and then I get back six. But if I don't put it back, I get seven. Okay? So she was able to anticipate what Jeremy was doing. Then it would still be in her interest to withhold. And Jeremy might think about that, think of it, sort of think, oh, okay, look, I really would like to get to 6-6. Six, six. It would be quite nice, be fair and everything like that. But what's she going to do? If she's self-interested, if she is, then I can't expect her to contribute to the Google account. I'm kind of throwing money away. Now, that's, we wanna, I want to analyze that. Now, Alice has a really nice little table that she drew, which uh, that's what we're going to try and systematize to our answer to these simultaneous games. We drew game trees in the for sequential games, what we're going to do now is look at payoff tables. And I'll hand out the, um, give you the handout now so you don't have to draw the, the tables yourselves. Okay. Now, unfortunately, uh, on, the, on the initial part of this and in the concept of the public good, I've got the answers the wrong way, so you want to correct that. Let's take one and pass it up behind you. There you go. Let me just see that it's up there. Yeah, that's it there. We're gonna we'll we'll eventually come to that one here. Let me just look at this. Um, you say you just made a mistake. I, I made a mistake there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, on the on the handout that's coming around. Um, On the handout that's coming around, I wanted to try to get the idea, the distinction between what we call a public good and what we call a private good. I mean, if it's excludable easily, then, and the answer is yes, then we're going to think of that leaning towards a private good. And if it's, so the, for a public good, we want non-excludability. So we want a, a no answer, okay? We want a no answer there and a no answer here and it's not rivalrous, then it's a public good. And if it is excludable and it is rivalrous, then we call it a private good. And there's lots of things in between. Like uh, a road, for example, like Rickenden Road. You might think of Rickenden Road, it's a uh, you know, certain width, it's got some footpaths, it's got some parking, it's got some bike lanes. Well, I don't know if there's got any bike lanes, it's a crazy place to bike if you do. But it, there's, there's some characteristics of the road. And basically, up to a point, you know, any one person, as you add on extra people, there's no extra cost of adding uh, uh, extra people to use the road. Eventually, it's going to get congested. But up to that point, you'd think it's a public good. Once it gets to the congestion stage, then, it be, then it's got this rivalry aspect, and it's not really a public good, okay? Um, and it, what about excluding people from the road? Well, it's tough to exclude people from the road. You could, okay, uh, but it's, it's very costly to do so. So that's why we would think of it as a public good or maybe a mixed public good. And anyway, that's, on the, that's on the handout. This is the table what we call a payoff table. And in a simultaneous game, the idea is that uh, with two players, you can 
conceptualize the strategic interaction by writing down a table, a two by two table, well, it might have more than two rows and two columns, but if there's two things that people can do, the red player, in this case, can give nothing, and, or they can give everything, and the blue player can give nothing or give everything, then there's sort of four possibilities, right? And what we've done up here is calculate the payoffs. So uh, if Alice gives none and Jeremy gives none, then they each retain their four, okay? If they both put their four into the group account, I multiply it by 50%, give it back to them equally, that's 12, that's six and six. But if the blue player gives everything and the red player gives nothing, then the, the red player has their four, but they also get three back from the group accounts, so that gives them seven, and vice versa over here. Okay, so this is what we call a, a, a payoff table. Now let's look at um, how we might think through this game. Remember, it's not a, uh, we can't observe what the other player is gonna do, but we could think it through what, what they would do if these payoffs, if the amounts in these cells, these numbers, higher numbers, tell us what their payoffs are, okay? Which in this case is their self-interest in coin. I mean, seven is a bigger number than six, and four is a bigger number than three, okay? When we're comparing the red numbers. Uh, you know, four and three, seven and six. So, let's have a look at what we call a best response. I'm gonna, we're going to use the X's and O's in here. And what I'm going to think of is, if you take the blue player, and you think of what can the blue player do? The blue player can give none, or the blue player can give everything. You think, well, what do I want to do? What, doesn't it depend on what the other person does? Well, let's have a look. Supposing the other person gives none. If they give none, and I give none, then I'm going to get four. But I give everything, then I'm only going to get three. And that's what Jeremy experienced in this, okay? On the other hand, if the red player gives everything, then if I give nothing, I'm getting seven. I've got my four in hand, and I'm going to get half. Of, they're going to give it four. gets multiplied up to six. I'm going to get half of that group account. I'm going to get seven. Okay. Whereas if I give everything, I can only get back six. So notice these two little stars. What we call these little Xs, we're going to call best responses. Now, it's not the same as seeing what Alice did, and then doing your best thing. It's like, I'm just thinking about it, what my best response would be to any strategy that she would choose, okay? And vice versa, Alice can do the same to, uh, to Jeremy. Let's look at it here. Red player can decide to give none or to give all. So that's what they're gonna do. But to do that, they wanna think about what the other player is gonna do. Well, there's only two things the other player can do. So supposing, um, we fix on this idea of the blue player giving nothing. Then the red player thinks, well, if I give none, I'm getting four. If I give everything, I'm giving three. I'm only getting three, because they haven't given anything into the group account. Four is better than three, I should give none, okay? So notice, notice what I'm doing is I'm looking down the column here. I'm looking at it from the perspective of the red player, trying to think through, well, if the blue player does this, this was Alice's reasoning, then I can get four rather than three. If the blue player gives everything, I can get seven rather than six. So I put the little knot above what's the best thing to do. Now, the knot here is the best response for the red player. If the blue player does this. The knot there is the best response for the red player. If the blue player does that. The cross here is the best response for the blue player, but only if the, the red player does this. The cross here is the best response for the blue player if the red player does that. In this little cell here, we have mutual best responses. Okay. Now that's gonna be the key idea for what we call eventually a Nash equilibrium. But at the moment, we don't want, I don't wanna bring in the idea of a, of a Nash equilibrium yet, but because we have this other sort of a deeper concept. The X's all line up in the same column. That is, the best strategy for the blue player, given this game, is to give none, contribute nothing. The best strategy for the red player is also to give none. Now, what do I mean by best? It means when the red player here is deciding what to do, they're trying to look at what the other player could do. They don't know. Okay? The other player could do anything. Okay? When I'm doing my bid, I don't know what the other guys are doing. Okay? but they could bid 1,000, 2,100, 2,200, blah, blah, blah. You know, they can do lots of different things, but supposing I've got a strategy that's the best thing for me to do no matter what they do. 
We call that a dominant strategy. Okay? So a dominant strategy is kind of a, a really good thing. It means you don't have to think too hard about what the other player is going to do because you've got something best for you no matter what they do. Now, both players have a dominant strategy here. This is the dominant strategy for B. This is the dominant strategy for A. Now, the way, how do we get that dominant strategy? Well, what we, what we were doing is we are trying to use this kind of reasoning process. I, I don't, you know, okay, I'm trying to figure out what to do. I don't know what to do, so I'll think about what they're going to do. What could they do? Well, they can do this and this and this and this. And for each one of those, I'm going to try and figure out what my best response is. In this particular game, you've got a strategy which is the same thing no matter what the other guy does, and we call that a dominant one. Now, later on, what we're going to do is we're going to look for bad things to do. Okay? It's like, you know, um, you could, we'll look at what other people do and think, is there something ridiculous? You know, that's ridiculously bad. And yes, there will be, or there may be in a game. Okay? And, and that way you can eliminate those ones. Well, here we've got a dominant strategy, which we're thinking, hey, this is a, what, if this is the game I'm playing, and I'm interested in my own chocolate bars, and that's Jeremy's if questions, okay? If, he, if he's interested in an equal split, that's a different kind of game because then the payoffs don't, re don't reflect his preferences. Okay? In this particular game, if he's just interested in his chunk of bars, then uh, as, a, as a blue player, seven is bigger than six, okay? I, the seven and three are split unequally. The size of the pie is only 10, whereas the size of the pie here is, is bigger, but he's not getting, he, here he's the smaller high in total, but he's getting more of it, okay? And if you're self-interested, then these numbers will um, reflect your preferences. Again, we don't need the self-interest assumption, but we just have to make sure what game are we analyzing, okay? If you wanted to create some preferences where Jeremy thinks this is the best one, I mean, there's four possible outcomes, we can assign, you know, grades A, B, C, D, or numbers 4, 3, 2, 1, and put them in and analyze the game, that's fine. But in this game, okay, here's, if these are the payoffs, then we would predict if people have dominant strategies, they would play them. Okay. Now, the two dominant strategies then, we isolate, we pull out, we put them in a list, and I got a little arrow here that says these are the payoffs that come from the dominant strategies. In the, in the, in the table, we're often just going to put a circle around the places where there's a mutual best response, or in this case, the two here are two dominant strategies. Okay? Um, now, I want to introduce another concept called a strategy profile. In this list of strategies, we could have had four possible ones. What we're going to do is think just generally, there's a strategy for the red players, there's a strategy for the blue player, and these are the four possible combinations. They could both give none, red could give none, and blue could give everything, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Um, so those are strategy profiles. We came out with dominant strategies, and we're going to put a little star beside these as their equilibrium strategies. Okay? They're the ones that the theory would predict. People will pull out and play their dominant strategies when they have them. Here, they're to give none, and uh, the total payoffs in this dominant strategy equilibrium are four and four. Okay? So the way in which we analyze these simultaneous games, the first step is you try to write down a payoff table. Okay? So you're sort of thinking, okay, I don't know... I can think of things I'm going to do. I can think of things the other players are going to do. I can think of my payoffs. I can think of their payoffs. I put those down on a table. I try to figure out, is there something which I can do which is a dominant strategy, which is best no matter what they do? If there is, then I'm going to do that. And if I, work at, if I put myself in the other player's perspective, if they have a dominant strategy, I should expect them to play that. Okay? And they should, um, they should be expecting me, if I have a dominant strategy, to play it. And we should each be expecting one another to play these dominant strategies. Okay. And in this case, we have a, uh, what we call a dominant strategy equilibrium. Now, in the table up above, there's some interesting ideas up here. If you look at these cells here, you could see that both players, you know, they keep their endowment. They don't give to the group account. They don't contribute to the, to the, the benefit of one another. Okay. But if they both did, they could both be better off than here. Now, this is what we call an efficiency comparison. Okay? And there's a, uh, an Italian economist named uh, Wilfred Pareto, where we, you sometimes we talk about Pareto efficient. Uh, 
but usually we're just going to talk about efficient. And efficient, often you sort of think, is this a technical term? Well, not really in game theory. In, in game theory, the efficient things to do are the cooperative things, things where both people, all players can be better off. And it, one of the tensions in, in game theory is they're trying to figure out, you know, okay, things happen, outcomes occur. Is this the kind of game where whatever's occurring, everybody actually could be better off? You know, there's some things which if they've done different things, everybody could be better off. If it is, it's kind of a, not a dumb game, it's a, you're kind of trapped, okay? And that's often what happens with the congestion kind of games. You know, everybody's making their choices about what time to go home and stuff like that, and they're doing their own kind of calculations. And so each of us, you know, we're all kind of wanting to rush home, and we're all making these simultaneous decisions. And when there's a lot of other people rushing home at the same time you're rushing home, they're imposing big costs, okay? And if everybody would just kind of, somehow we could coordinate a little bit of delay together, we could all be better off. So this is, this idea of an efficiency comparison is to look in the game, see what might have happened where both people could be better off. Now that comes back to the second question on our list of six questions, which was, what is the extent of co co potential for conflict and cooperation in the game? Okay, well here, there's definitely some possibilities for cooperation. Um, this other cell here is called Pareto inefficient. And the idea is it's inefficient because there's something else which people, if they had done it, would have made them both better off. And this, is, this particular game is called A Prisoner's Dilemma, which you might have seen from and heard about in other courses. And we'll look at, the, we'll look at in, the, in the next lecture, we'll sort of pull out the classic Prisoner's Dilemma. But the basic idea is that what seems like a sensible thing to do, okay, play a dominant strategy, leads to an interaction where if everybody hadn't done the sensible thing to do, play their dominant strategy, they all could have been better off. There's kind of, individually it's rational to do this, it looks great, but if you look at it kind of from the group as a whole, and nobody is, but if you did, you think, oh, there's these other nice outcomes we could have is somehow we could get there, okay? But the individual rationality kind of built into this it's not just self-interest, it's the preferences, okay, um, can lead you to these inefficient outcomes. Okay, so next week we're going to continue on looking at these simultaneous games. There's a homework exercise on Blackboard, which is what I'd like you to do is, suppose it's not an all-or-none game. Suppose Jeremy can, and, and Alice or Pearl and uh, um, Joe can keep all four and only give none, or keep three and give one, keep two and give two, keep one and give three, okay? So there's, it's not all or none. Try to work out what the payoff table is in that matrix, and then analyze it using this dominant reaching. Re reasoning. Is there a dominant strategy for each player when they can only just give a little bit? Will there be, a, you know, okay, we, in the all or none game, nobody wanted to give anything. Could we get some, some contributions when we can divide it up a little bit? Okay, so that'll, we'll look at that next week. But go into the Blackboard site and have a look at that question.